You need to grow up, mister. That's what I said to my son, Stephen. At the time, he was three. I was 30. Um, and so when I think about that, both of us needed a nap. We were desperately in need of a nap, the two of us. And he had been whining and complaining and pushing my parental buttons and all the rest. He was throwing a first class three-year-old temper tantrum. And so I thought it was only fair that I throw a temper tantrum too. Now, the thing was, I wasn't kidding at the time. I was mad. And I pointed my finger in that little three-year-old face and I told him, you need to grow up, mister. And it was in that moment, there was like a freeze frame father moment, right? It's the kind of thing you laugh about later when you think about it and you talk about it with your kids and stuff. But I angrily said those words to my son, Stephen, and it was as if God froze the frame right there and, and turned it around and said, Scott, you need to grow up, mister. And see, I thought about this. It's okay for a three-year-old to act like a three-year-old, right? I mean, they're supposed to after all, but it's really kind of not okay for a 30-year-old to act like a three-year-old. And so kids need to grow up, that's true, and I'm glad they do, and in some ways I'm sad they do, because you know what, they're so squishy when they're small, you know, they're just, they're just so, you know, you kiss the top of their head, and it's just, it's so nice, you know? And then later they won't let you do that kind of stuff. But, but you think about it, it's great that kids grow up, but you know, it's great when grown-ups grow up too. Um, and I think about it this way. I think part of the reason we were issued three kids like we were is that I needed to grow up, right? They were going to grow up, but I needed to grow up. And, and being a dad, it kind of does that to you in some ways. And I titled today's talk, Don't Be a Big Baby. Don't be a big baby because 1 Corinthians 3 is all about growing up. In fact, the whole book is kind of about that and just catching anyone who missed any of these thoughts, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians that we're looking at now, um, it's a great follow-up to Romans because Romans is like all this deep theology and stuff, but this is, our, this is practical answers to difficult questions. This is a, a question and answer session with the Apostle Paul. The church that he had founded, uh, they kind of floundered after he left, and, and there was a point where they were saying, we can't figure some of the space stuff out. Could you help us out? And so he writes them back answers to their questions. And that's what this book is all about. And so when you think about it, the Corinthian church was kind of in an arrested state of spiritual development. They had gone so far, and then that's as far as they went. And they kind of plateaued in that point. And if, if, if the truth be known, they were kind of sliding back from that spot. They had peaked at a point, kind of, and now it was like, and they were... They were kind of sliding from that point. And I think about that, it's an important thought for me anyway, that there really is no neutral in the life we live. You know, we're either going forward or backward, but we're probably not standing still for any real length of time. So I'm either growing older without growing wiser. You know, that's one of the things I always say on my birthday, another year wiser. Uh, I hope that's true. You know, but, but it'd be kind of sad if it's a, a, another year dumber and older, you know. Uh, it, so it's good. It's good to move forward. And so to be stuck in immaturity, they were kind of big babies, if I could put it that way. And so 1 Corinthians 3 is Paul saying to the people that he knew so well, don't be a big baby. Don't be a big baby. And when I was growing up, that was one of the worst put downs you could, you could do. You know, I mean, to tell a kid. You are such a big baby. You know, when you're in junior high, to be told you're a big baby or high school, you know, no way. I mean, there was no way we wanted to do that. Do that. You know, um, our, one of our faves was act your age, not your shoe size. Does anyone remember that? <coughs> well, there was at least a time in my life where my shoe size was bigger than my age. I kind of, my, my feet grew and then, and then I outgrew them eventually. You know, I don't si wear size 51s these days, but... But that was a big put down, you know, act your age, not your shoe size, uh, don't be a big baby. And so this is what this chapter is about, growing up, growing up. So got some grown ups in the room, got some younger folks, got some older folks. But the bottom line is, no matter where we are, we need to grow up. That's what this chapter is saying. So verse one, if you look at it with me, it says this, and I, brethren, could not speak to you 
as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Now, again, what he says there is, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing some baby talk right now. And that's, again, there's some hard things said in these chapters, but I like that. See, I mean, some people, they only like to hear what they like to hear. But you know what I like to hear? I like to hear what I need to hear. That's, that's truly part of growing up, I think, is I don't just want to hear what sounds good. I want to hear what is good. I want to hear the right stuff. And so one of the things that's true is that God did start, you know, physical babies out little. I don't know if you've noticed this, you know, but babies are little, right? And that's how that we kind of come into the world. We come into the world without a lot of skills, without a lot of, of abilities, really. But um, one of the reasons it's great that kids are little is that they're little tyrants, right? They're little criminals. Can I get an amen from any parent who knows that? Um, it, it's just true. I mean, they're sweet little criminals, but they are criminals. You don't have to teach them to do the wrong thing. They just kind of naturally know those things. They know how to wake you up in the night. They don't even care that it's night. They don't care that it, they were up last night. They don't care about any of that stuff. They bite. Fortunately, they only have gums at the beginning. They kick. They scream. I mean, they just do what they do, you know, and it's good. And it's kind of cute when they're little. It's like, oh, look at them. They're throwing a little tantrum. Isn't that cute? Babies are cute. But big babies aren't cute. I mean, if, if someone's still kind of acting that same way later in life, whoa, 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 whoa. See, behaviors that are kind of acceptable and even accepted and understood in a one-year-old start to be pretty unacceptable in a 21-year-old, right? I mean, imagine a 21-year-old with a little rattle, you know, and a diaper and jumping up and down the crib and crying because they're not getting what they want and they need to take a nap. And you say, I don't have trouble picturing that you know because we as adults need to teach our kids to grow up emotionally and spiritually as they grow up physically but you know what that means we have to do it too that's whoops that's the hard part wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute you mean i gotta grow up yeah you gotta grow up see when you think about this a mark of maturity that's some of the things we're going to talk about today just some simple ones and here's one that i wrote down here's the first one that i thought through which is a mark of maturity is how people talk to you and how you talk, right? How you talk and how others can talk to you. When, when, when there's a little kid, right, everyone does this like baby talk stuff, like, you know, and stuff like that. And you're like, imagine if you go into work and your boss like says, I need you to do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Open your mouth. Here, here comes the train with the food. You know, and you're like, what is going on here? There's something wrong with this, right? And so the way someone talks to someone and the way they talk has a lot to do with the mark of maturity. And Paul's kind of laying down a challenge to him. He says, I couldn't talk to you like grown-ups. I would have liked to. I mean, I would have loved to in a way, but he says, I can't talk to you like adults. I'm kind of having to say some of this stuff to you like your babes in Christ. Now, there were babes in Christ there in Corinth, but there were others, or he wouldn't have said this, who by that point should have grown up, should have gone on to a little more maturity. And so again, this is a corrective letter, right? And Corinth was kind of out of control. And, you know, we do these things in, in elementary school where it's like, if you can hear me, clap once. You know, if you can hear me, clap twice and all that. And you see all these classroom management things that are for elementary school. But sometimes I see people carry those on to high school and I'm like, this is dumb. I'm sorry. I am not going to do with a bunch of people in church. If you can hear me, clap once. You know, if you can hear me, clap. It's like, wait a minute. These are adults. All you, all you should kind of have to do in a way is if there's an adult talking, if you're somewhere and there's someone doing something, people quiet down, right? I mean, it's part of a mark of maturity that people shouldn't have to do things that they have to do with kids. And, and that's what he's saying. I, I couldn't talk to you like mature spiritual people I wanted to. Um, he says, I'm having to talk to you kind of like carnal kids. Now, anyone who has a, like a Latin background or Latin language background, um, you know, carne means meat, right? Carne is meat. Um, so carne asada is a meat dish in uh, Miami, if you get it. Uh, but this is what he's saying. Carnal, it, it means meat. He's saying, I, I'm, I'm having to talk to you guys like a kind of like meatheads, right? 
Uh, it's kind of like just fi- purely physical. Somebody who can't think beyond kind of the, the, the five senses, right? That's what a baby is. Hungry, what do you do? Whine. Tired, what do you do? Cry. Angry, what do you do? Flail and wail around. He's, well, wait a minute. Those are, those are kind of basic responses that are on the physical level. But he says, you know, if you're, if you're a baby, maybe that's okay. But he says, let me think beyond that. See, and this is really, really important theologically to me anyway, because Paul didn't call them non-Christians. He didn't call them non-believers. He called them baby believers. Um, and when I think about this, this is why it matters. He calls them brethren. He doesn't say, look, there's a bunch of you. I don't even know if you guys are really Christians. He doesn't say that. Nowhere in this passage does he say any of that stuff. He says, brothers, brothers, stop being big babies. You got to stop being big babies here. Sisters, you guys got to be getting along a little different than a bunch of babies. And he includes them in the faith family, even though they were complete babies, long-term babies, carnal, unspiritual people who didn't get it quickly. And I love that because he still calls them brethren. And I think about that because, you know what, practically speaking, one of the things I've learned over my Christian life is I'm going to be super, super slow to make any judgment calls on whether someone has a legit faith or not. Why? Because, you know what, people grow at different rates. And I know people who are always big on trying to put someone in or out of the faith based on something they did or the way they say this or that. And I'm like, no, Paul didn't do that. I'm not going to do that. Jesus didn't do that. But he did challenge people. And he said, hey, you want to you wanna grow up? You want to live your whole Christian life as a big baby? Well, I don't think so. And so I look at that and say, well, I want to I wanna grow. I want to not be carnal. I don't want to be whatever that is. I don't want to be a meathead. I don't want to have to have people give me baby type, boo, 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 goo, goo, you know, and stuff like that. Well, it's fun, and it's funny when kids are little, and our kids, I, I won't embarrass them with all of their different things, but one of the great ones from our, us growing up, the kids referred to a bath as taking a tub. I want to take a tub. And it, it's just, it made us so happy to hear we didn't want to correct it, because we're just like, you know, finally, I guess around 12, we told them it's actually called, a, you know, taking a bath. No, I, I, we didn't do that. But, and the refrigerator, there was a, there was a disguise, and again, I'm not giving you the specific kid who said it, but the refrigerator, which I thought was brilliant because it's like you put it in the fridge for later, you know, you, and so it's the refrigerator. Um, but, but again, if somebody's still like, well, I'm going off to take a tub, you know, you go like, what's wrong with this person, you know, or... When you think about how people talk to you, and when I think about this, this is one of the things I ask in life. Hey, you know, can we just talk to each other like adults? Um, you know, that doesn't mean we never have fun. We never have funny conversations or anything else. But I'm just, I'm so big on people treating people like adults. If you have something hard to say to me, if you have something difficult to say to me, just say it. It's okay. You don't have to like skirt the issue. You don't have to do any of that. Just come out and say, hey. This bothers me. This needs to be dealt with. Or, you know, I, here was a misunderstanding. Can we deal with it? Yeah, man, let's talk like adults. You know, and, and that's all I, in a way, I ask of, of people to. Can we, just, can we just talk straight? And so this is what Paul is saying to me. He says, verse 2, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you weren't able to receive it. Even now, you're still not able. Now, again, he's saying some stuff to him. The first mark of maturity was how we talk and how people can talk to us. You know, how can I talk with my kids? How can I talk with my wife? How can I talk with my friends? Can I, can I just talk and, and not have to, to, you know, wrap everything in soft things so that nobody gets their feelings hurt or any of that? Hey, just, just let's, let's talk about it. He says that's the first one. But then the second mark, he says what we're able to eat. I don't know if you remember these things. I was actually one of my parent skills, Len will verify, I can get food down a baby. I am amazing at getting a kid who doesn't want to eat something to eat something. I mean, we can, we can get it done. And I, and, I, and I was able to do it at a fairly quick rate. Uh, so we're talking strained beets. Oh, man, strained beets. We can get them down. Mush carrots, pureed turkey paste. Remember that stuff? Um, you actually move on to the meats, you know, but they're not really, they're not like meats. They're like meat pudding stuff, you know, and they're like, you have to dress it up. You do have to do the airplane thing. You do have to, here comes the train into the tunnel and all that stuff, you know? But the older you get, again, 
Lynn isn't chopping up my, my food into little tiny beats and going, come on, Scott, come on, you can eat it, come on. I just, I, that's, that's messed up, right? So unless you're lactose intolerant, you get the fact that milk, he talks about two things, milk and meat, right? Milk is still okay for adults. You never outgrow the basics. But a mature diet needs more than milk. I mean, it's like milk. Yeah, you need mac and cheese too, right? But no, it, it needs solid food. It needs something that you work toward and you get toward. And what is he talking about? Well, when he's talking about messages, when he's talking about truths, there are truths maybe I couldn't really chew when I was two that I'd better be able to chew when I'm 52. I better be able to take some hard truths in life and go, you know what? I'm not going to run from that reality. That's right. That is true. That is true right there. And I'm going to have to chew on that. I'm going to have to digest that. And I don't need someone to chew it through for me and, you know, grind it all up so I don't have to deal with some of the difficult things in life. See, if it's not pureed and strained and bottle fed for a baby, well, we get why, right? They don't even have teeth yet. But at some point, at some point, this is what Paul was talking about. He talks about it in several points. 2 Timothy 4.3 is a good cross reference. He says, there'll come a time when people won't endure sound doctrine. Isn't it interesting that he uses the word endure? Sometimes you have to endure some stuff where you're like, wow, this message is kind of rough. I feel like I'm having to endure it. And you're like, yeah, because it's true. And again, I've... I've I think about things that as a, as a young guy, I think my parents sheltered me from some of the stuff that, well, and I'm appreciative of that. You know, there were things I didn't need to know or wrestle with <coughs> at age seven, <laughs> maybe that I do have to now. But there's people who, again, they grow up, but they don't grow up. They grow older, but they don't grow wiser. They are refusing to chew through the realities of life. And to grind through those things and they say, well, give me a milkshake message, man. Give me something sweet. Give me some. I don't even have to chew it. Ooh, everything's a smoothie. <sighs> and see, I, I like smoothies. I love them. I, so little effort, you know. Don't even need utensils. Just, you know, thank you. Someone else clean up after me. But you know what? This is what he's using as an example. He's saying, you know what? Only if it's easy and happy and requires no change. That's what I want to hear. And if you haven't noticed, uh, Paul's words were true. That they're, The truth is you can pack a place, pack a place with a happy message about happy things and happy stuff. But you don't have to chew through anything. You don't have to change tomorrow. You don't have to go home and evaluate whether you've been a big baby as a husband over the last week. Oh, I don't like this guy. He, you know, tells me some of the things I'm doing are wrong. What? <laughs> well, don't be a big baby. See, one of our kids, when they were asked to try a new food, I remember they said no. And we said, why? This is such a funny answer. My taste buds have a mind of their own. This came out of a kid, right? My taste buds have a mind of their own, Stephen Benjamin Clunch. And so um, spiritually, I said, well, guess what? Your dad has a mind of his own too. And, and you know what? You have a mind that it's got to be a little stronger than those taste buds. That it's like, oh, okay, if it's not a sugary donut, uh, with a, with a, this was the kind of thing he used to eat when he was young, right? We actually went to a, a fair, uh, like a... Uh, youth fair in Miami and they had a Krispy Kreme burger it, it instead of a bun it had two donuts and burger in the middle you know again just like kind of whoa well his taste buds said yeah 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 yeah. you know and later if you eat that for a lifetime uh, it'll be a short lifetime and your doctor someday will tell you why you can't keep doing that um, and so when you think about this what's great is we talked to Stephen today, and he's like, he's eating salads. He's eating interesting vegetables that I haven't even heard of. And I'm like, this guy has grown up. His, his taste buds that had a mind of their own. Well, guess what? His mind 
was a little stronger than that. And that's what Paul's saying. I'm having to puree all my preaching and I'm doing Bibles for babies. And you know what? It's okay for a baby to be a baby, but it's not okay for an adult to be a big baby anymore. He says, you know, I, I, I've got to say this. And he says it so many times that we can't miss it. No matter what Bible book it seems we're in, we hear something somewhat similar. Let me give you another cross-reference, Hebrews 5.12. Hebrews 5.12 says, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You come to need milk and not solid food. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now that's an amazing passage right there again hebrews 5 12 but highlighting a couple thoughts out of it real quickly he says you've come to need this that's an interesting thought right because it says it suggests that you used to be able to chew through stuff and you got and you know what just give me a milkshake um you used to be able to think on thoughts that actually required some wrestling in your life of well, what is what am I here for and what am I doing right and what am I doing wrong and what should I do different? And, you know, you know, just now nah, I'll just take a frosty, just a frosty and a big old spoon. You know, that, that'd be great. He says for reason of use, he says, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't discipline yourself in some areas of spiritual thought and action, he says, you probably will go backwards because it's only through use, atrophy. See, I think about it in, in my own life. The biggest problem I've been having with my shoulder is that I injured it and then because I didn't want to do some of the rehab or I wasn't even sure exactly what to do, but I knew it hurt when I did certain motions. I went, oh, okay, I'm not gonna do that. Now, again, when you think about that, what I did is I allowed muscles in my arm and shoulder to atrophy. And so when I finally went to an expert and they said, what about if I move it here? Oh, don't move it there. And they go, no, we need to move it there. Um, and oh my gosh, well, he said, well, the problem is your tendons, your soft tissue is all atrophied in there. We're gonna have to bring it back to life. And I'm like, it's alive, you know, it's alive. And, and, and yet, what was the tempting thing to do? Shrink back, hold back. No, 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 that hurts. I don't wanna hear that. Does it, but here's the thing, if you've ever had a cast, have you ever seen that? What comes out of that? It's like a tiny little baby arm. Have you seen it? I mean, it's like someone has a cast for a month and they take it off and it's like all tiny. And you're like, what happened to the, you know, John Cena or whatever? It's like, you, you know, baby. And this is what Paul says. If you, if you do not exercise your spiritual thoughts and muscles in life, it'll atrophy. And he says, you're still carnal, verse 3, for where there's envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Now, this is another mark of maturity. I put it this way, which is what our world revolves around is a mark of maturity. Because a baby, right? What does a baby think? If a baby has a little baby mind, what do they think? It's all about me. <laughs> the world revolves around me. I mean, this is amazing. I cry, and all these beings these big beings come and deal with whatever i need dealt with right that it, it seems like the world revolves around me so when you're a baby you don't know anything about science but you do know that you are the center of the universe everything exists for me <laughs> and about me um, if you know anything about child development stages they go through a stage where they don't have object permanence right that's the first thing that you have and there's a moment where a kid actually realizes that if you put a ball behind your back it still exists right but when the baby's a baby you put a ball behind your back the ball is gone <gasps> the ball is back it's a miracle you know it's a magic trick and and that's why you can just get a baby laugh i'm pretty good at baby laughs i can get babies laughing just simply from you hide your face you show your face. It's very simple. You know, I do that with Lynn. She doesn't laugh. I, I, I don't know. I'm like, yay, look. You know, but object permanence. So you know what? Part of the mark of maturity in my life is there's times where God has felt so close that I just know he's there. And there have been times where God has been nowhere. And do I know where he went? 
He went nowhere. He's right where he's always been. Object permanence is for me to realize in my faith, you know what, there's times where God, I get the gospel goosebumps. God is just here. He's so near. He's so real. He's so amazing. And then I have an experience like they had in the Old Testament where they would go three days without water in the desert and they go, God brought us out here to die. You go, what's the matter with you people? Don't be a big baby, man. It's okay if the kids think that way, but it's not okay if the adults think that way at some point. You know, a mark of maturity is really realizing our solar system revolves around the S-U-N, but my spiritual system re revolves around the S-O-N. And you know what? It doesn't revolve about Scott. This, this universe was not created for the glory and enjoyment of Scott Clonch. Darn it. <laughs> I can't believe that. What a bummer. Uh, you mean I'm not the center of everything and I don't need to be the center of other people's thoughts and everything? Else? Nope. See, and I think about this, problems on the horizontal plane in life point to problems so often on the vertical plane where somebody just started thinking that everything revolves around themselves or the people around them and everything else. And it's a mark of maturity for me to say, hey, you know what? The, the vertical axis of God hasn't changed at all. See, I think about junior high uh, Christianity, as I'd call it, you know, which is you didn't say hi to me in the hall. Uh, I'm not your friend. Division, strife. This was the stuff going on in Corinth. That it's like, you gave me a crusty in church. And you're like, I, I had a stomachache. I, I wasn't thinking about you. I wasn't doing, you know, but really, when, when you think about what junior high is, or middle school, as they call it here, you know, it's, it's muddle school for me. I mean, it's like they just muddle through. But so often, seriously, if you ask a middle schooler, what are you thinking about right now? Myself. And I think everyone else is thinking about myself, too. Like if I have um, some, some little spot somewhere on me, I'm thinking everyone's thinking about me as much as I'm thinking about me. And you're like, I, I hate to tell you, but mark of maturity, nobody's thinking about you. You know, it, it, that's, that's a reality. I don't walk down the street and everyone's look, well, look at Scott's shirt. Nobody cares. And yet you think about that and you start to realize God cares a ton. And there are people I care about and there are people who care about me. But I'm not going to walk around thinking that everyone's thinking of me and prioritizing my needs above everything else. That's what it is when Paul says, I've learned to be content in all things. See, when I think about this, he says, I know what it was. I have learned. Think about a man saying, I've learned how to be happy and content and satisfied with stuff. He says, I know what it is to have a lot and I know what it is to have nothing. And he says, and I, you know what? I can be happy with a lot. I can be enjoying that five-star hotel and the five-star chef with the amazing meal. I can enjoy that. I have met people who can't be happy there. I have been to, Lynn and I have been to, you know, some retreat, a marriage retreat or something. And we're talking the Ritz-Carlton. And there were people mad sending back their meal because it wasn't just right. And I was like, this is the best meal I've ever had in my life. And it's not something. I mean, the cook of in is not quite whatever. I'm like, what's the matter with you? And then, you know what? On the other end of that, he says, and I also have been at the bottom of a dungeon. And it wasn't so bad. He said, you know what? Food wasn't as good. Uh, you know, bed wasn't as nice. But uh, I learned I, it's okay. It's okay on either end. And strife and sibling rivalry, right? My sister and I, if I go visit my sister, which we did recently, we didn't fight at all. But I remember when we were growing up, we did. See, we liked each other, but we, we fought. And in fact, we, she has a, a pretty bad scar on her finger from something I, when I slammed a door on her. But, uh, but she's forgiven me, but I think. Uh, but one of the big point of contentions was the car. We had a Malibu Classic station wagon. It had enough acreage for two people to be happy in the back. I can assure you there was so much back seat room. There was even a way back that you could be in. And there were only two of us. But somehow we needed the same real estate. And so my sister, she liked to sing, but she really liked to sing just to make me mad. So she would sit in the car and sing a little song when I was in the back seat. And I was like, stop, stop singing. She's like, I can sing if I want stop singing and 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 so there was this whole thing that would go on and then my parents would finally get involved and they would say karen if you could please 
you know, respect your brother's wishes. So then she would sing silently, but she would smack her lips. I'm not doing anything. You know, it was just like this. I'm like, what would, now that, I laugh at it because th we were teenagers, you know? This is what teenagers are supposed to do. But what if we were still doing it? Or what if Lynn and I are on a cross-country trip, you know? And I, I, I will get out and spank everyone in this car, you know? And you're like, it's you and me, Scott. This is weird. <laughs> you know, well, oh, okay. Well, I, I, I got to learn to have a little different mentality, right? And so this is what he's saying, you know, divisions, divisions families and friendships and easily offended people and people carrying grudges all through their life and you go that's okay if you're seven man but you got to be a little bigger than that you got to grow a little bit past that that oh i'm offended at everything anybody says have you noticed how many big babies we have in our society i'm like are you kidding me oh you're you're, you're that mad over that thing you can't Entertain somebody who has a different perspective than you do, have a dialogue, have a, a meaningful conversation, or it's got to get to mud throwing and name calling? Are you serious? Don't be a big baby. I feel like I could turn on the news and that would be all I'd say to about everybody on there on any side of any situation. I go, yeah, a bunch of big babies. <laughs> you are a bunch of babies. Did you notice? Paul doesn't even call them babes in this verse. What does he say? You're acting like mere men. I think about that. He's upping the ante, isn't he? He's saying, I'm talking to you like babies, but you know what? <laughs> I can even just say we're supposed to be a little more than mere men. What does that mean? Well, what he's saying is, what are you doing different than a, a non-believer? How are you differentiating yourself from the way everybody is? Well, I'm not as bad as that guy. And he's like, yeah, but you're not as good as you, as you need to be at this point, you know? And verse 4, he says, one says, I'm a Paul. The other says, I'm of Apollos. Aren't you just being carnal? Who's Paul? Who's Apollos? We're just ministers through whom you believe the Lord gave to each one. Here's another mark of maturity, 4 and 5, verse 4 and 5. It's knowing our heroes are still human. Our human heroes are still human. What do I mean by that? There's no superheroes here. There's no super Christians anywhere. There's no, wow, this person just gets it right all the time. See, marks of... Maturity, one, one of my favorite guys on the planet is a guy named Tom Oatmeyer. And he is a true, real-life hero. He just had a birthday the other day. And I've learned more from this man than you could possibly imagine. As, as dumb as I am, I, I would be far dumber if I hadn't known Tom, Tom Oatmeyer. But one of his phrases is, the best of men are men at best. Um, he's, a, he's a guy who was uh, in the Air Force. He, he was a guy of incredibly high honor. He has flown, you know, Mach 2 with his hair on fire and all the rest. He, what hasn't that guy done? And yet, you know, he's just a guy. And kids tend to idolize other people, right? They're perfect. They're everything. <laughs> and you go, they're not. They're not. They're not perfect. They're not everything. They're a mess. So many of them. So many of them are sad. So many of them are divided and, and angry and, and, and immature and stuff like that. And you go, you just messed up. In fact, you probably know a real life human who's nicer than that person is. But you're nice to your idol and mean to the real person. And you go, that, okay, that's part of being a kid. But it can't be part of being an adult. How do I treat the people closest to me? That's the real rub for me when I look at things. I go, not who do I, oh, I met a celebrity and I got him all this stuff. I got him, I got him a meal and water and I served him all day long. And, and then, but, but your wife asked her, like, get it yourself. And you're like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Why are you so nice to somebody you don't know? And you're so mean to somebody you do. He says, you know, who, who's Paul really? He rebukes his own fan club. It's kind of funny. He's like, some of you guys are real impressed with Pastor Paul. He says, who am I? Who am I? I didn't come and talk about me. You put me on a pedestal, I can only disappoint you. He says, it's mature to give honor where honor is due. Yes, respect great examples. Okay, have mentors that you look to and saying that person is worthy of some respect. But the issue was they were giving glory to people that only belongs to God and you know the problem with that is hero worship really is an immature thought it really is 
They needed to grow out of it. Paul, Apollos, Peters, and Peter, these are heroes of the faith. Don't think, I'm not going to look them up when I get to heaven. <laughs> Peter, I know I said you were an idiot half the time, but please don't be mad. Uh, because the, these guys were flawed. They were deeply flawed. And in the end, they were just people. And that's one of the encouraging things is these heroes of the faith, half the time they were zeros of the faith. Seriously, they did some really bad, dumb stuff. You go, don't look up to them. Look up past them. This is what he's saying. In the end, we're just people that you believe through. You believed in Christ through our example. He says, but, but that's about as far as it goes. Don't believe in me. <laughs> if you believe through me, great. If I, if I was somehow inter, able to introduce you to Jesus in a better way, great. That's awesome. You can be thankful for that. But don't think for a moment that I'm anywhere close to him or that, that your faith should be in me. Because here's the thought. Here's the problem. If your faith is in a fellow human, when they fall, when they fail, so will you. Your faith will falter with them. And I've lived long enough and walked long enough with Jesus to find out people are people. And some of the most impressive people I ever knew were some of the most depressive situations I ever saw. Things that I was like, I, you know, I could uh, sadly recount more than, than we have time for, where I could just simply go, Oh, not that guy. Not that situation. No, 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 no. And I watched people. Here was the problem. I watched people fall and falter because that person fell and faltered. And I realized, ooh, ooh, that's not a mark of maturity. The mark of maturity is, well, that's, it's a sad story, but it's no shock. The best of men are men at best. The best of people are people at best. There's, there's nobody here who's going to get it all right. And so if my faith is in some person or some pastor or some organization, when that thing becomes a disorganization and blows up, then I blow up with it. And you go, wait, 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 wait. A mark of maturity is you can separate out. God is God and man is man and never the two will meet. See, and I think about this, I enjoyed a really good meal the other day. Somebody took me out for it, and I really, it was great. And I told the wait person my compliments to the chef. I didn't say like, this meat is amazing, how'd you do I, I realized they're the wait person, right? I also thanked them because the service was great. But I said that the chef who made the meal is the one who deserves the, the compliment for the meal. All they did really is bring it from the kitchen to the table and this is an analogy to just say any messenger in your life who's been a blessing yeah be thankful you know it's great to be thankful to the people who who have brought a message from the kitchen to the table but you know what god's the cook god's the chef if there's anything that my life has counted for this is what paul says i'm just the guy bringing out an amazing steak from god that's and yeah that's cool that you appreciate it and i brought it out hot and and fresh, but you know what? My compliments to the chef. If you're gonna be impressed with anyone, be impressed with God. Because he is never gonna fail, fail, fail or falter. I just made up a word, to falter, um, which is to falter and fail at the same time. And so, uh, marks of maturity. Um, you know what? One of the things we used to tell people, because one of the things that happened to us in Miami is <coughs> the church we were a part of, <coughs> grew really from a, a small handful of people to a, to a, a, a land full of people. <laughs> it was like lots of people, so many people, you know. And uh, in that, a lot of celebrities made their way through Miami. There's a lot of Miami people, and it's just kind of the land of, of many celebrities and musicians and actors and actresses and stuff. And people would come uh, to the church at various times. And this was the instructions we gave to people who were serving in different capacities. Treat them like normal people, right? If a, if a VIP comes, treat them like an ordinary person. And here's the other side of the story. If an ordinary person comes, treat them like a VIP. Well, what does that mean? Just treat everyone like there's somebody special because they are. The, the guy who just came off the street, treat them like they're special. The person who, you know, owns the streets, Treat them like they're ordinary because they kind of are. And you know what? A lot of them, I think, really appreciated that. They actually appreciated the fact that people were like, <laughs> we're going to, like, 
plastic coat the seat and put it up on the wall and stuff. And you're like, it's just a chair. It's just a person. <laughs> they have problems like everybody else. You know, just the world doesn't revolve around that. And so you think about it, this is what Paul says in 6 through 8. I planted, Apollos watered. God gave the increase. No, neither anyone who plants is anything, he who waters is anything, but God gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. I like this. You know, I put as a mark of maturity, patience, and partnership. And I actually separated out the word part because I want part to be emphasized. I'm just, I just play a part. You just play a part. You know, play your little part. We're just in an orchestra, right? Where if you watch an orchestra, you might be able to pick out like the cymbal crashes and stuff. But for the most part, what you do is you just hear great music and you're like, is that the third trumpet playing, playing that part? I don't know. But this sounds great. It just sounds great and everyone's playing their part. And I just play a tiny little part in a process. And this is what Paul's saying. Look, I, mean, I just got a guy with a watering can. You know, uh, Apollos over there, he had the watering can. I, I dug a little dirt. I got dirty hands. He's got water to wash it off, right? That's, that's all we are. And again, it wasn't false humility on his part. It was an important thought because they were puffing themselves up in Corinth. And they had a hierarchy of who was the best and who was the worst and who's important and who isn't. And, you know, when they would do communion, uh, people would say, no, 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 no. Dirty people to the back of the line. And all of these things where Paul was saying, wait, 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 big babies, <laughs> big babies. All you big babies who think you're important, maybe you need to get to the back of the line and you need to put to the front of the line some other people because that's a mark of maturity. A mark of maturity is, is patience and partnership and realize I don't do anything by myself. The outcomes, that's God. The input, that's on me, but that's all on me. I, I'm not responsible for the outcome. Here's a weird thought for me as a parent. I got three kids. I am not responsible for the outcome. I'm not. God will not hold me accountable for the outcome. He'll uh, hold me accountable for the input. I, I am responsible for the input, <laughs> but I'm not responsible for the outcome. That's on them. They're going to have to do that. Each will be rewarded for their own labor, right? Again, when, when a baby's a baby, a baby's a baby. But when an adult's an adult, my parents are no longer responsible for whether I'm responsible or not. At some point, if I'm a bum, that's on me. That's on me. And the mark of maturity is I pay a little part in the partnership of parenting. I play a little part in the partnership of pastoring. You know, maybe something I've said, something I've done, something I've been somewhere along the line has been helpful to some people. But you know what? That's only a part of it. I'm only responsible for the input. I am not responsible for the outcome. If you listen to this and go, boring, I don't care. I don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm not going to change anything as a result of anything God's word said. I, but nothing here for me. Then you go, I'm fine. I'm good. <laughs> I, I did my part, right? I did the part that I could do. And God gives the growth. And there were times in my life where I thought I was responsible for the growth. But that's a mark of immaturity because I think I'm something more than I am. What? <laughs> I'm just a parent. I'm just, a, I'm just yeah, I'm a guy. I, I'm, I'm a dad. You know, and sometimes when kids are real young, real young, they think their parent can do no wrong. And then they go through a stage where they think their parent can do no right. <laughs> right? But I realize right and wrong. My parents were just my parents. And you know what? Thank God for them. But they... They can't ruin my life, but they can't fix it either. You know, at some point I got to deal with stuff. And this is what we saw. This is what I learned. You know what? We weren't doing anything different when nobody was coming and when everybody was coming. We really weren't. There was a season where we were doing the exact same thing we'd always been doing. And people are going, what are you doing different? We're not doing anything different. God's giving the increase. We're just doing the same thing that people used to think wasn't worth anything. And now some people think it's worth something. And God gave the increase. And this is Acts 2.46. He says, Continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread with house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of art. That doesn't sound like a very complex model. Uh, they just kind of, you know, went through their lives caring about each other and simple and eating and talking and laughing and praising God and and then verse 47 of Acts 2 says, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. He goes, oh, okay. So they just, they just went around not being big babies and God added new babies. You go, huh, that's pretty interesting. 
That's pretty exciting. And, you know, patience is part of the maturity. I want to plant and water and reap all in one day, right? I want like instant uh, tomato. Lynn, Lynn's doing these really cool things with plants out in our yard. And here's what's funny. Every night she waters them. Every night. I'm like, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to go water the plants. All right. Um, Y'all have fun, you know, but I'm enjoying the reaping part, which I didn't do that either. I just do the eating part. Um, but that's part of the partnership. There's a, there's a guy that, I, that we've had the opportunity to meet and serve alongside, and he's amazing, and his name's Greg Laurie, and he does these harvest crusades. And he has done a ton of reaping in his life. But you know what? If nobody invites anyone to his thing... <laughs> He can put on quite a show and nobody goes. And he says that all the time. He's like, you may think of me as the, the evangelist. Oh, Greg Laurie. But he says, I'm just nothing. I'm just like an international harvester. You guys have invested in your friendships and they've seen your faith and they've seen the changes in your life and they bring you here and they're just ripe for, I just gave a 30-man message and gave them an opportunity to do something about that. See, and I love that because we're partnering with people and one of the partnerships we just, we just started, although this one goes way back, but this part of it uh, is new. Lynn's going to, I think, put up a, a picture of a lady named Amor. And Amor means love in Spanish. And you couldn't have a better name for a better person than this. Just a person, but an amazing one. And we're, she's doing a radio show in Miami on the station I used to be on. It's still down there. Let, you know, what do you know? Scott left and it stayed. Um, you know, who, who am I? Just a guy who got an opportunity. But now she has an opportunity, and she focuses in on human trafficking. Uh, she has an amazing backstory in her life. It's not a happy story, but it has a happy ending. And uh, she actually owns a tattoo parlor in uh, downtown Miami uh, where they minister to people who uh, many of them were up all night, up all day, and up all night by the time they get to her door. And uh, she's just an amazing person. Uh, has a love that is beyond anything you can imagine for God and for people, hurting people. And, uh, you know, Linda and I have been friends with her for many years, but she, part of what she does with her tattoo parlor, part of human trafficking is they, they tattoo the, the people they own. Um, there's, it's a brand, it's an ownership, and they take these off of people for free. And they take them off of gang members and everything else for free. They do it as a ministry, and they're just really good at what they do. And so when you think about this, um, she actually is being featured in Focus on the Family on the cover of the magazine this time, but they're doing a weekly show. Um, I, I think, in fact, they're trying to get it to daily in Miami because Miami is one of the major ports of human trafficking. And if you don't know what it is, I mean, it is people owning people for sex, labor, whatever, uh, you know, just completely... Uh, a, a problem that has been going on for as long as people have been people. But I think about this, we're, we're helping sponsor that, Glasshouse Church is helping sponsor that radio program. We're partnering with them. Now again, she, I had lunch with her and, and you know, bought her lunch down there and it was great. Um, and, and it said, tell me about what's going on in your life. And um, she said, well, you know, we're doing this. God's opened a door. Uh, you know, the radio station goes in, into lots of prisons and places that, uh, that, you know, there's a lot of people listening in a lot of different places. And that's true. The places that, that uh, it reaches many different people that way. She said, we're looking for partners, and here's what it would take. And I'm like, huh, well, we can't partner, but we can do part. Uh, we can be part of a partner. And she said, that's great. Every little part helps. You know? And so when I think about it, that's one of the things we're doing. But then when I see what God is doing in there, this is what Paul was saying. He's saying, you know, opportunities are everywhere. You know, We're God's fellow workers. This is verse 9. He says, you're God's field. You're God's building. Fellow workers with God, that's a pretty cool idea. Doing a work with God. You know, when the kids were young, they always wanted to help me, um, which was awesome, and they still do. But, I mean, when I went away to Miami uh, and I came back, Bethany had, had cleaned my car really nice. It was awesome. But when she was younger, she also liked to help me clean the car. But all it meant is it took longer, and I was definitely going to get wet. I can directly remember a time when I came home, and th there was a free car wash in our driveway. It was, it was Bethany, and, and she had the hose, and she actually not intentionally, but hit me twice as I was coming out of the day. I'm going to clean the car. And I'm like, whoa, and I'm going to get a shower. So this is what I know, that if I'm partnering with God, he doesn't need my partnership, right? I mean, I think that's a good thing to remember. When a kid says, I'll help, 
put together the bookshelf, all you know is it's gonna be crooked and take longer and you're gonna to have to redo whatever they do, right? But it's the partnership. I would never as a dad say, no, I don't need your help. Oh, yeah, I need your help. Here's the hammer. Here's the thing, you know. And go, oh, wow, it's so good. You know, bang, bang, bang. And then you go back and undo it and put it right. And so this is what he says in verse 10. I love it. A different analogy. He says, according to the grace of God, which is given to me, I, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation. Another one builds on it. But let each one take heed how they build on it. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus. Now, anyone who knows real estate knows location, location, location. The rock and the sand story. You know it from Matthew 7. And when I was working at Exxon and I, I had a, a sort of high-rise job, I, the, there, I was looking over at a, a building project that they were doing. And, you know, I was doing my work, but I was also watching them do their work. And they, they were doing this stuff where they would just dig and dig and dig and, you know, pouring concrete down into these long tubes and everything and putting rebar down in it and the reinforcements and everything and one day on my way to lunch i asked uh, i stopped and the foreman was standing right there and i said hey uh and uh, you know I, i'm not complaining i'm just learning i said you you guys are you've been here like for months and you're like always you know what what's your plan for it i see it's going to go way up there you know and everything but the, you're like you know the scheduled opening day is like such and such and you know it just seems like there's a lot of groundwork so tell me about that. And he said, here's, here's what it is. If you want to go high, you got to go deep. And then I was like, let me write that down. Let me think that through. If you want to go up, you got to go down. You got to, you got to build a foundation. He said, we'll make the deadline. But you'll see it's about two thirds groundwork. And one third, the easy part is getting it up once you've laid that foundation. That's actually a whole lot easier. And this is what Paul is saying. Think of this analogy for just a minute. He says, there's no other foundation except Jesus. You can lay it on anything else, and that's a bad foundation. But he said, that's not the end of the story. Yay, I found Jesus. I founded my life on him. I have a foundation in him. All right. I just be a big baby the rest of my life. I got this part right. I got the land right. I got the location right. He says, no, verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold or silver or precious stones or wood or hay or straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it's revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. The day is capitalized in my translation, probably yours too there in verse 13, but it's a mark of maturity to prefer, I wrote it down this way, built to last, not just built fast, right? Built to last. I like my friendships to be built to last, not just built fast. Oh, you know, well, it, you know, good in a day, bad in a day, flash in the pan, you know, uh, I, want, I want to try to do something with my life. Well, let's do it quick and do it bad, you know, quick and dirty. You go, wait, no, 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 no. See, when I was growing up, we didn't know too much about foundations, but we thought of ourselves as builders, right? So we built forts. We actually built a fort in a tree. Uh, at least it was in a tree the first day. Um, after the first big wind, it was on the ground. Um, fortunately, we weren't in it at the time, <laughs> but we didn't spend any time <coughs> on foundation. We, you know, when we were stacking blocks, we would do these um, contests with Legos and stuff like that. And it was all about my tower's bigger, my tower's better, my tower's taller, but they all fell over because we wouldn't spend the time on actually making it something that would last. And so, you know, when, when people are young, they, they do it even now on social media, they're like, Happy one week anniversary, you know, and stuff. And you're like, wow, seriously, seven days, new record. And you're like, yeah, that's messed up, man. That's kind of messed up. You know, when you think about this, somebody the other day, their parents were celebrating a 60 year wedding anniversary. I was like, what? I mean, that is just, I'm impressed. That's impressive to me. See, when you're little, you think bigger and faster and all this stuff, you know. You round up your age. You're not six. You're six and three quarters, whatever that means, you know, to a kid. But, you know, I'm six and 243 days. And if you want to swindle a kid, I don't want you to swindle a kid. That would be wrong. But if you wanted to, all you got to do is if they have a dime, give them a nickel for their dime and they'll take it. You know why? Because the nickel's bigger. 
and heavier and thicker than that skinny old worthless dime. And a little kid will fall for that. Oh, yeah. Ooh, this one's bigger. It's better. You go, no, it's, it's worth half as much. See, and quality and quantity are things that are maturity matters, right? You think about that after a while. It's not quantity. How many, how many friends do I have? Not, that's not a question. How many real friends have I been friends to? Well, that's a different question. You know, what is the quality of my life? Don't build a shack on a rock. You know, the rock is a great place. Don't build a little hay house. This is what this passage is talking about. It goes from gold, which would have survived a fire and actually be purified from it, till hay, which is like, hey, it's gone, you know, if, if it's on fire. And this is what he's saying is that people's lives may look extremely impressive. If you think about how big a house you could build out of hay with a million dollars, that'd be a pretty big house, a big hay house. But he's like, but it's gone. It doesn't last. And then he says, well, a gold brick house, man, it wouldn't be that even that big. But he says, if you build on the right place with the right stuff, you'll be surprised how your life will be built to last, not just built fast. And he says, we're bringing it home here. He says, verse 14 and 15, if anyone's work which has been built on it endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss. He himself will be saved, yet as th so through the fire. The fire here, don't, don't think of it as anything of... of you know, a lot of times people are, oh, is, is, is talking about hellfire here? No, it's not, actually. It's talking about a refining reward fire. It's talking about things that will go with you into eternity. See, and this is a, this is a reality that, you know, it's a meaty topic. That's why I say some people won't endure things. You don't hear this very often. I, don't, I can't remember the last time I have sat in a church service and heard this reality right here, which is that people can make it to heaven as a gift and have nothing past that to show for it. You can be a big baby in all eternity. This is what it's talking about. There's nothing built, nothing to show for that life that there is, just because somebody is headed to heaven doesn't mean the story is over, right? It's, if there's nothing done, nothing lasting, nothing to show for it, well, it's a huge deal to be on the right side of eternity. I, I get that, you know, but there's more to it than that. The Bible makes it very, very clear here and elsewhere that eternal life's a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't, you know, deserve it. You can't do works that make it, uh, you know, oh, okay, well, you get into heaven from that. You get into heaven because Jesus opened the door for you and said, come on in, it's free. But this is what it says. Eternal life's a free gift, but you can be a carnal, immature, big baby believer, go to heaven when you die, but rewards at that point forward are for those who have earned them, who have been wise and faithful with their actions, with their attitudes, and with the life that God gave them, rewards. That means Paul's experience of eternity will be different than the thief on the cross who Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But that guy had zero to show for his life. He had thrown it completely away. God will still take him. But Paul did not throw away the rest of his life. This is where it's a big boy, it's a big girl thought that I'm giving you right now. There are rewards. There are rewards past the free gift of heaven. Paul's experience of eternity will be better than mine. I can guarantee you that. That means that heaven and eternity are not identical for everyone. Maturity matters. It makes a difference now. My life now my maturity now, right now, makes a difference in my experience to my friends, to my family, to strangers. And don't think that that doesn't continue on past my death point. It only then becomes most relevant in the eternal things. He says, whatever you build, what you build, the location is the issue of salvation. Now, you can only build it on Jesus. But he says, but you decide, is it gold, silver, things of value? Or is it hay, stubble, and things that will not make it past my grave? How high can I go? Well, how deep did I go? How much did my life matter? <laughs> I think about it in a very simple way, and I say it to my daughters in the front row. I really appreciate you guys that you're not big babies. I think about this. Bethany's going to serve little babies because she's not a big baby. 
She's going to go into ICUs with little kids and families and deal with life and death situations because she's not a big baby. Because she worked really, really hard in school so that her life could count for other people's lives and do something. She could have an easier life. But she's going to have rewards in heaven because she didn't just accept the free gift of salvation, but she said, what will I do with the abundant life that God has given me? And I look up to that and I honor that and I say, that's hero stuff there. And I think about that with Carissa. Carissa hasn't just sat on the gifts that God has given her. She's stirred them up. She's doing things with them. What you build matters. And, you know, I think about this. You can be full. Everyone will be full in heaven. Nobody's going to be like, wow, this stinks. But you can be full as a little shot glass and you can be full as a rain barrel and there's a different experience <laughs> there's a different capacity there and that's what god's saying if you grow your capacity here you'll have a greater capacity there and when is the last time you heard that in a church service but you see it right here in what's going on here sometimes we forget oh well you know i'm forgiven i'm going to heaven oh, oh great well what are you doing with what you've been given I'm forgiven. Okay, but are you forgiving? Are you merciful? Are you growing up? Our eternal differences, our eternal experiences will differ on the basis of our faithfulness here. Can't be faithful enough to earn heaven, no. But God's gracious enough to give reward, whatever that is. What is it? I don't know. Serve and let, the God, uh, let God sort it out. I know it's going to be better than I think. It isn't going to be a $20 Starbucks gift card. See, when I think about this, I'd be very wise to realize salvation's a gift. But what I do with that salvation is my gift back. And there are eternal implications. And God says, you need to grow up, mister. Do you not know, verse 16, that you are the temple of God, the spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, whose temple you are. What's he saying? May live like somebody who's got God living in him. Respect yourself and respect the person next to you because that's a vessel of God's also. How could I mistreat a person? How could I devalue a person? How could I put down a person? How could I treat a person as if they were just for my pleasure or my entertainment? They're a person. How could I buy and sell them as if they were cattle? Man, he says, the temple of God, God will judge that. God will God will honor Amor as she fights human trafficking and he will get the people doing it. And if he doesn't get them now, he's going to get them then. And you think about that. That's a serious thing. He says in verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. He says he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And the, good, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They're futile. <clears throat> this is kind of the last mark that I want to leave with you. The, the mark of maturity, we know how little we know. See, when I'm, a, when I'm a kid, I think I know it all. Man, do I think I know it all. There was a time when I thought I knew an awful lot about computers. Man, did I know a lot about computers when I was 25. I knew a whole lot. I knew it all, really, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I was very, very pleased with myself about how much I know. You know what's funny? I'm 25 years longer around computers and, and technology, and now I know I don't know nothing. And the, the pace of that stuff is faster than I can keep up with it. It's a quote attributed to Mark Twain. What's funny is you go look and see, is it really Mark Twain? We don't even know that. <laughs> it's funny. They're, they're like, it's debatable whether it was even him. But Mark Twain. When I was a boy of 14, he said, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much that man had learned in seven years. Again, I love whether it's, it's Mark Twain or not. There's some wisdom in that, isn't it? It's like, I thought the old man was dumb. But as I'm becoming an older man, I'm realizing how smart that guy was. See, and up till age 27, I'll tell you this, I was way too smart for God. Anyone who knew me back then, I would have said, you know what, that's good for you. But I know a little more than that. 
I know a little more. I don't really need the crutch of Christianity. I don't need any of that stuff. You know, I'm too mature to really need faith. I, I know a lot. I've read a lot. I've seen a lot. I've traveled a lot. I don't really need scripture. I don't need its guidance. I don't need any of that. And you know what? 24 years later, as I sit here, I'm amazed how much God's learned in the last 24 years. And I say, you know what? The old man, <laughs> he knows a few things, doesn't he? See, the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. That's what he's saying. In the wisdom of this age, he says, well, maybe you'd be a fool in this age. Why do you waste your time with that stuff? Why aren't you out chasing money? Because money, you chase it forever and it chases you back and then it eludes you and it doesn't do what it said it was going to do anyway. But God said that already, didn't he? And so I like to think of so many people like a man searching for his keys under a lamppost and a guy came up and asked, you know, hey, I'll help you look for him. And he says, uh, you lost them right here. And he said, no, I lost them in the field over here, but the light's better here. And you go, well, you're never going to find it there, <laughs> right? I mean, th there's a certain logic to that. It's like, well, it's easier to look here, but you're never going to find it. See, where you lost it is over there. And I think about this. It's easy for me to take the easy route, but the truth isn't found there. The truth requires me to chew through some very difficult things sometimes, to wrestle with something. To go, yeah, but if God, is, if this is true, then why this in the world? And if God is good, why that? Uh, God says, I'm big enough to take those questions if you're big enough to answer them. If you're big enough to take my answers. You big enough to take my answers? That's what he asked Job. Job said, I got a few questions for God. He says, all right, I'm right here. I'm listening. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Well, I wasn't there. Um, where were you when I uh, figured out all these scientific principles that are now causing you some difficulty? Well, I don't know. I guess I wasn't there. See, maturity takes me not just answering things the easy way, but the right way. And it's time for me to grow up. And the great news is I have a great examples, a great examples to grow up into in the Bible, but around me too. That's part of what you guys are in my life, whether you realize it or not. Uh, I'm growing up a lot from learning from you. And that's why verse 21, he says, there's no one to boast in in men for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or... Diane or Billy or, you know, our, our whole next door neighbors there. I mean, my kids, everybody. I, my parents, I'm still learning from them, you know. Whether life or death or the world, I mean, I got some growing up to do. God says, you got some growing up to do, mister. But the great news is, again, I have lots of people to grow up with. And he says, and you're Christ. And Christ is God. So you're not missing any of the tools you need to grow. And so I thank you, Lord, for the fact that you have given us opportunity. You've given us input. The output, well, that's really up to you and it's up to us. Uh, I can't be responsible for someone else. Nobody else can be responsible for me. But I can certainly respond to what you've done and what you're doing in my life. And I pray that if there's some uh, one little phrase, one little thought, one little verse, one piece of today that somehow lodge it somewhere in our heart and we need to do something about it i pray that we would maybe it's just the way we treat our own family or the way we talk or the way we walk or the way we eat or whatever it is uh spiritually speaking whatever those things are if we need to make adjustments my wife can't have a big baby in the house my kids don't need a big baby as i get older uh they need somebody who's maturing and somebody who's growing and as we hear that siren even as we go we realize, hey, there's life and death situations all the time. There are people uh, facing all kinds of difficult things. And the world doesn't need a bunch of big babies in the church hearing what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear so that we could go out and maybe be uh, the teachers, the examples, the, the mentors, the, the practical help to people who, who maybe are stuck in some place and they don't know how to get out of it. And we do. And I pray that you would give us that kind of heart, that kind of hands, that kind of heads and actions, that we wouldn't just uh, grow older, we'd grow up. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.